process, winner of 18 regional Emmy Awards, including the 2010 New York Emmy for our coverage of voting rights and the 2010 Mid-Atlantic Emmy for Best Discussion Series. Put this man in the hole. 90 days. Solitary confinement. We've seen it in the movies and on TV, but it's still a tool used for punishment and control inside New Jersey's prisons. Is it cruel and unusual? Is it necessary? And is it worth the human and monetary cost? That's next on this edition of Due Process. Major funding for due process provided by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. And by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy. Additional funding provided by the PSCG Foundation and the Thomas and Agnes Carvel Foundation. of us who take our freedom for granted, it may be hard to even imagine ourselves in prison, locked up. But if that's tough to contemplate, now imagine yourself confined to a cell, 23 hours of every day entirely alone. I'm Sandra King, Raymond Brown is off, and our focus for this unsettling edition of Due Process, solitary. The place the prison may put you if you're seen as a threat to the always uneasy equilibrium of life on the cell block, as a source of trouble or disruption, or even as a potential target of prison violence. In New Jersey alone, more than 1,600 inmates are living in what is now referred to as segregation. But whatever you choose to call it, for those housed in those units, life remains a solitary existence. And though the physical conditions inside the cells have undoubtedly become more humane, Prisoner advocates say the psychological impact is still not so different from what Reuben Carter encountered decades ago in Trenton State Prison as portrayed by Denzel Washington in The Hurricane. You had better strip right now and put on that uniform. I can't do that. Put this man in the hole. The hole. Solitary. In New Jersey, Reuben Hurricane Carter must be its most famous former resident. 90 days. Thanks to the film that won an Oscar nomination for Denzel Washington. Here comes the story of the hurricane. The man the authorities came to play. And made Hurricane Carter an international symbol of a justice system gone wrong. But I'm innocent. I've committed no crime. The crime's been committed against me. <laughs> but it was the time he spent in solitary confinement here that we may remember best. You can't break me because you didn't make me. You understand? Huh? What we call dark cells. They existed. They don't exist anymore. And we're told that New Jersey is among those who've abandoned the whole the stripped-down solitary cells, like the one that once held Hurricane Carter. All right, Carter, time's up. And yet the Department of Corrections refused to let us see even an empty cell in what's now called administrative segregation or management control units. So we can only guess at whether they resemble this cell from a chilling episode of Law & Order. SVU. You son of a bitch. Is it three days, not a week? It was three days. I swear. John Jay Professor Martin Horn, you reject the term solitary. Yes, I do. Who's run the jails in New York City and the prisons in Pennsylvania. 
insists that old image of solitary is just no longer accurate. A stripped cell with no window. Are, does somebody use them? You know, but in most state prison systems, most county jail systems, responsible administrators nowadays just don't use them. I was going to jail by myself. Oh. Mm. Did they have me on a, they put me on a no contact status, which means that uh, I can do anything with a group or, or another individual. But Audrey Latulo's description of his own long-term experience in the New Jersey State Prison at Trenton paints a very different picture. Uh, 22 hours one day, 23 hours one day, 24 hours following day. Yeah, yeah. A sometimes artist, self-professed anarchist, and one-time member of the Black Liberation Army, convicted first in a bank robbery and later in a shootout with a drug dealer, Latulo says he spent more than 20 years in Trenton's management control unit. This is just a, a picture of a, of a drawing of the cell that I spent 22 years in. 22 years, he describes, as psychological torture, a concept echoed in that Law & Order episode. You, 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 put people in jail, walk away. You don't give a damn about torture. Torture? I'm sorry, were you beaten, waterboarded? What they did to me was just as bad. What's he like said that time? Uh, that, that, that focusing on breaking me psychologically. Mm -hmm. Isolation to a lot of people just causes um, mental and emotional decompensation is, is the word that psychologists use. In order to survive long-term long -term isolation, you need to have a strong sense of self on who you are. And then I seen other people that, that psychologically self-destruct, and, and I was determined that wasn't going to happen to me. So I just created a cell program, what I call cell program, cell program to survive. I would get up in the morning, I would read, write exercise, I would write letters. For prisoner advocates like Bonnie Kerness and the American Friends Service Committee, Audrey's become a symbol, not just of inmates held for long years in solitary, but of men they say are there, more for what they think or say, read or write, than for what they do. Because you just locked away for entertaining thoughts that they don't approve of. As early as 1978, Andrew Young, who was U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations at the time, was widely quoted as saying, there are hundreds, perhaps thousands of people I would describe as political prisoners in U.S. prisons. I certainly would not agree or condone placing a person in segregation merely for their political views. Indeed, even for expressing their political views. No if, matter on how the other extreme. hand, if on the no other hand. No matter how extreme. No matter how extreme. But the people who run prisons, including those in New Jersey who refuse to be interviewed for this report, say there are problem inmates, as many as 1,600 in New Jersey, who need to be in segregation either to protect them or to protect the prison from them. In the end, they just left me there. All that time alone. What was it like? Death. Except you're still breathing. And all you hear is the sound of that breath for days, months, years. Does it really feel like a living death, or is that just so much Hollywood hype? And even if it is as brutal as what we heard and saw in that field piece, is it just a necessary evil, a tool that corrections officials have to use to keep their prisons under control? We'll put those questions and more to Jack Terhune, now Leonia Borough Administrator, whom we first met in the late 90s when he was New Jersey Commissioner of Corrections to Bonnie Kerness, who runs the Prison Watch Project for the American Friends Service Committee, whom we saw briefly in the field piece, and in Newark to Professor Alexander Reinert of Cardoza Law School, who teaches civil rights, prisoner rights, and the Constitution. Welcome to you all. Uh, Jack, let me start with you, because you just sat through six minutes of hearing and seeing a description of administrative segregation, control units, whatever you want to call it, solitary, as torture. Is that an accurate way to portray it? 
Uh, no, Sandy, I don't think it's torture. Uh, I think, uh, as you indicated, it's a necessary evil uh, to maintain the uh, orderly operation of the 13 prisons in the state of New Jersey. Um, we have 25,000 inmates that are incarcerated. Uh, that's probably larger than the average suburban community here in New Jersey. And anytime you have that many people, uh, whether it's in an institution or whether it's in a community, somebody is going to violate the rules. Somebody is going to break the law. So you use this as punishment? No, it's not punishment, although it can certainly be viewed by some as punishment. It's intended to amend behavior so that uh, the staff and the other inmates are not placed at risk by those that are prone to violent behavior. Uh, you got to remember, they all come to the prison system because they've been convicted of a criminal offense. Not all violence. It, it could be a nonviolent offense. But regrettably, out of uh, the total, some are there for very, very violent offenses. Their behavior is prone to violence, and that's what they're about. And whether they're inside an institution or whether they're out, they're prone to, uh, to violent behavior. Bonnie, 1,600 people in New Jersey prisons who need to be separated from the general population? There's a big difference between an administrative segregation unit, which, is, which are isolation units, the management control unit, um, and the security threat group management unit in New Jersey, which was recently closed. In terms of severity of condition? Administrative segregation units are for the purpose of punishment. A prisoner has committed an infraction and gets sentenced to an isolation unit. A finite amount of time. A finite amount of time. In the management control unit, people were placed there for their thoughts, for what the administration thought they could do if they wanted to. And ultimately, a court agreed, appointed a special master who released all of the people in the control unit except four people. The security threat group management unit was purportedly to change the behavior of uh, people in street organizations. Um, but, but, and but, but, footage, the, the, conditions, the conditions in the security threat group management isolation unit, uh, footage was gotten out um, by uh, one of the prisoners, and the footage was of horrendous Shocking. brutality. But, but bottom line, no matter which of those units you're in, do they not all have one thing in common, and that is that you are isolated You're from other isolated. People? The conditions are similar. And do I you think call the that reasons, torture? Do you call I, yes, isolation I torture? I call isolation torture, and the United States has signed the convention, United Nations Convention Against so Torture. Uh, the, uh, the United States has signed the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, and the United Nations agrees with me. The Center for Constitutional Rights has now filed suit on uh, what they call communications management units, and, which are isolation units across the country. And, and let, me, let me ask Alex. Firstly, is this torture, and is the U.S. on the receiving end of a whole lot of criticism, particularly from other first world countries, and is it justified? Well, the United States is certainly under a fair amount of criticism. It's, it's an outlier with respect to the extent to which it uses prisons and certainly to the extent at which it uses isolation units. Does Europe still th have isolation units? In I'm their sorry? Europe. Do we still find isolation units there? Uh, generally, I think those have uh, been restricted, if not severely uh, limited. And, and I don't think any other uh, country that we would hold ourselves up to comparison would ever permit isolation to the extent that we permit it in the United States. That is, it's not just about using isolation units. It's about the length of the sentences in these units. And I, I do have to take one issue with what Jack said, which is uh, this isn't about prisoners who have been violent. It, some of the prisoners have been violent in prison. Some of them have put a piece of paper up that obscures the cell. Some of them were delusional and a correction officer interpreted them as planning an escape when an escape was impossible. So there are all sorts of reasons that people end up in isolation units, and part of the problem is, is that there's a tremendous amount of deference 
to uh, prison officials, and, and courts have very little role in stepping in. So are they good reasons why people wind up in these units? Well, I don't, I, I don't think... One has to first ask, uh, what's the purpose of these units? Uh, if the purpose is to help people deal with violent behavior, I don't think the units accomplish that purpose. There's no... I think there's any evidence that people in the units receive good anger management counseling, uh, receive access to loved ones that will help them deal with violence. So if that's the purpose, I don't think they're accomplishing that purpose. If the purpose is to get people to comply with prison rules, sometimes that works. Uh, but the more we control people, I guess to some extent, the more they will comply with rules. But at the same time, the more dehumanizing it becomes for them and the more there are mental breakdowns and also the more difficult it is for people to adjust when they're released from prison. And I think whenever we're talking about prison policies, we have to assume that people are going to be coming out on the street and we want them to be able to be productive when they come out on the street. Alex, let me, let me go back to Jack um, to ask about something that Alex said. He said it isn't the courts and I would say also not the commissioner of a corrections um, system in a place like New Jersey, who determines who goes in, who, go, who comes out of those units. Is, it, is there enough oversight that you would feel comfortable, that you felt comfortable during the years that you were the commissioner in New Jersey, that the right people were being put in isolation units for the right reasons? I, I can't speak to every specific case, Sandy, uh, but uh, the state prison system here in New Jersey is regulated by the administrative code, Title 10A of our administrative code, that um, those rules and regulations are promulgated by the, the Department of Corrections. Uh, they are subject to public hearings. They are subject to adoption. Uh, and then, of course, uh, they're subject to legal challenge. Right, but uh, what happens when, the, when those rules get in the hands of guards, deputy wardens, people who make the actual day-to-day -day decisions? Are you, are you worried about how those things may change from the time that they are made in good faith to the time they're actually executed? The fundamental executed? tenet of our uh, government is the name of your show, Due Process. And we have due process. There are hearings for the inmates uh, that are conducted on a regular basis for disciplinary infractions, for placement in a close custody unit. So you don't um, get placed in one of these units without a hearing? No. Uh, you can be for an emergent matter. In other words, if there's a fight or there's some type of disruptive behavior, uh, the uh, tour commander or the administrator in charge can temporarily place an inmate in order to uh, address the, uh, the action uh, that's emergent in nature, but then it's subject to a hearing. And the, the uh, uh, behavioral control uh, committee will review these things um, on a regular basis. It's not a hearing where the inmate has a lawyer. No. No, the, the inmate is entitled to have uh, another inmate advocate uh, on, on his defense. Uh, the staff has to present evidence uh, as to the infractions, their behavior. Uh, is it a court of law? Uh, do you have an attorney present? No, you don't. Um, but certainly, in my opinion, uh, those inmates who feel that they've been uh, unjustly uh, placed in administrative segregation can, through the legal process, uh, file motions in federal court for a violation of the Eighth Amendment. Bonnie, you've been doing this work for 30 years. Mm -hmm. Do you that. see it the way Jack has described? Uh, for me, the history of control units, and I'm not talking about punishment units, there's a difference. The history of control units was political. A, a person doesn't spend 22 years in solitary confinement. You're talking about Audrey, whom oh, we saw Audrey in and, and thousands of others throughout the country. Um, so the, the genesis was political in the 60s and 70s. The management control unit opened up in 1975 for very political reasons. Those were the years that many of the uh, imprisoned Black Panthers found themselves in New Jersey. Uh, we saw that experiment in isolation across the country uh, become federally funded. I've had commissioners of corrections tell me that they were building supermax prisons. Even though there was not anybody to put in them, they were building supermax prisons because of federal funding. 
What has happened is those supermax prisons across the country have been filled with the mentally ill, and now we have communications management units, which are isolation units uh, holding Islamic, people largely of Islamic descent. The so, European so, so High add, Court. So add to what you were talking about in terms of um, uh, ideas that might be threatening to the system. Add to that security concerns. And Alex, is that something that we're seeing? As I've gone through the literature, I've seen um, isolation units in U.S. prisons compared to conditions at Guantanamo. Is that fair? Well, I think for some of the units that may be fair. I think the, the uh, most salient part of these isolation units is the lack of human contact on some of them and also the severe restrictions on recreation and on other um, activities outside of the cell. And I think it's really important to emphasize that to the extent people suicide in prison, those, it's, there's a much higher rate of suicide in isolation units. And, and, that yet, and yet we a, hear that one reason people are put into these units is because they may be suicidal, and it's a well, way to keep them safer. Well, to, it may be a way to keep them safer as long as there's also a provision for mental health services, but it's also true that there are an awful lot of rules in prison, and it's very easy to break any single one of them. Uh, and people with mental illness have an even, uh, are even more likely to break some of those rules and not really be able to understand how to conform themselves to those rules. So some of those people often end up in isolation units much more often, and that leads to decompensation. It's really a, a vicious circle, in part related to the fact that there has been such a defunding of mental health institutions in most states. And so most individuals with mental illness who also have criminal histories are going into prison. There's just very little uh, support for individuals with mental illness. Which puts somebody like Jack Terhune, when he was corrections commissioner, in a very difficult position. Well, but, I... but before we talk about mental health, I want to give you a chance to respond to what Bonnie said about people being put in these units for political Well, thought. that's Bonnie's choice of word, political thought process. And, and yet I'm not going to dispute uh, the concept necessarily, because some of uh, the rules are, in fact, adopted to prevent injury to the rest of the inmate population. You have to remember, uh, we have 25,000 inmates presently in New Jersey, and we are uh, legally responsible to protect all of them, not only from the outside, but from each other. And if you're going to have inmates and the security threat management group that Bonnie made reference to that was recently closed uh, was a product of the evolution and, and uh, proliferation of gangs in the New York metropolitan area uh, where we had violent gang behavior in the streets um, that resulted in people uh, being killed, uh, being maimed. And uh, those individuals were sentenced to prison, and they continued to provide and pr perform gang activity while they were inside. So we had a whole increase. So that increase. seemed to you a good reason to put well, these people in an isolation Well, it's preventative, in my opinion, uh, so that they couldn't perpetrate their violent behavior against other inmates in the institutions who perhaps uh, didn't want to participate in gang behavior. It's a behavioral uh, issue and and you know we argued and uh, obviously from what Bonnie said the state lost uh, in being able to keep uh, that many units uh, that many inmates excuse me in the security threat management group up at Northern State Prison. As our time winds down, it goes so quickly. Um, the irony uh, for me, Bonnie, you you work for the Friends, the Quakers, mm -hmm. and yet this whole idea of putting people in isolation. Um, in order to improve their souls and make them better people once they've committed a crime, actually starts with the Quakers. Mm -hmm. Who believed uh, in silence as a form of uh, communication with God, restitution, um, and they also acknowledged very early on that it didn't work. No touch, torture so, didn't work. So let me ask each of you, starting with you, Bonnie, what do we expect if we come back here 10 years from now and have this same conversation? We've seen this rise and fall of popularity, if you will, of isolation units. Will there be more of them, fewer of them? Does anyone care? You can't give me a reason for the letters that come across my desk describing physical, emotional, and, Let me and go chemical torture, so there will be less. Alex, 
Well, I hope there will be fewer. I think I also hope we'll have a more rational criminal justice system that focuses on how people end up in prison and how we can help them when they get out of prison. And finally, with five seconds left, Jack, what do you expect? I said at the top of the show, regrettably, it's a necessary evil. Uh, I, I wish we could change everyone's behavior, but we have those that are disruptive, and you have to deal with it. Well, your behavior here has been great today. Thank you all. We are out of time much too soon for this edition of Due Process, but my thanks to Bonnie Kerness, to Professor Alexander Reinert, and to former State Corrections Chief Jack Terhune for taking on a difficult and controversial subject. It's what we do best here on Due Process, so we hope you'll come back every week for our provocative look at law and social justice. Till then, for Raymond and all of us here, I'm Sandra King. Thanks for watching. Punish someone's in prison. I mean, you have to have a way to punish them somehow that's going to mean something to them. If you're in solitary confinement, it's for a reason. You shouldn't be allowed to be out. You should be by yourself. That makes more people more animals. So I believe that it should be, it shouldn't be no solitary confinement. They have to do what they have to do. As long as they have people in humane conditions, you're in prison for a reason. I'm for solitary confinement, even though it costs more money. To be honest, um, some people need a time out. For hardened criminals uh, and for people who shouldn't be mixing in with the rest of the prison population, I think there's a place for solitary confinement. Major funding for due process provided by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. And by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy. Additional funding provided by the PSCG Foundation and the Thomas and Agnes Carvel Foundation.